Good evening. It is now 6.03. <laughs> Sorry for the delay. So we're um, kind of just wrapping up from the last committee meeting. Um, welcome to the community development meeting. I'm the chair, Lewis Washington. Today's meeting is being recorded and will be available on the city's website. Thank you for joining us. Sure, it's here. <laughs> So we'll just do a quick roll call. Like Councilmember Watnett's here. Here. I'm here. Councilmember Johnson's here. Yeah. Madam Mayor, uh, City Clerk, and City Administrator. So everyone's accounted for. Thank you. Okay, so now for our first uh, item of regular business is to approve the agenda. So move. All right. Second. Sounds good. Any questions on the agenda? Okay. If there are no questions, then we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, next order of business is public comment. Is there anyone here who would like to make a public comment? In the audience, we um, here in the chambers, we did suspend the um, virtual comments. So it's just chamber comments today. <clears throat> okay, so the next order of business is to approve our last meeting's minutes dated August 5th of 2024. So move. Second. All right. Open for discussion. Any discussion items for the minutes, August 5th? Okay. If there's no discussion, then the meeting minutes for August 5th are now approved. <clears throat> so our next uh, agenda item is the agenda bill 24-055 text amendments for Senate bill 5290 compliance. At this point in time, I'm going to turn over the meeting to Director Arteche to introduce the item. Evening, council members. Uh, we have our land use planning consultant, Andrew Levins, here tonight to talk about uh, updates to the municipal code to address Senate Bill 5290. Um, if you remember, we had a brief intro on this topic. Um, it deals with addressing state mandates for permit processing times. Andrew? Good evening, council members. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. Like Director Arteche had said, my name's Andrew Levins. I'm a land use planner. Um, and I've been working with the Community Development Department to implement the requirements of Senate Bill 5290 in the Snoqualmie Municipal Code. As previously mentioned, the purpose of this Senate bill is to uh, increase um, the cert permit timeline certainty across the entire state for cities and counties planning under the Growth Management Act. And so previously, before 5290 was enacted, the Growth Management Act uh, imposed a blanket 120-day requirement for cities to issue a decision on a permit application um, from the date the application was determined to be complete. This new Senate Bill 5290 comes into effect uh, statewide January 1st, 2025, and it um, stratifies the uh, required timelines for different types of permits, generally based on how complex they are, but the uh, actual requirement is tied to uh, how it's reviewed. So in the analysis portion, portion of the agenda bill, you'll notice that uh, from this point out, if these changes were to be enacted, the required timeline would be 65 days for permits which do not require public notice, 
100 days for permits, permits which require public notice and 170 days for permits which require public notice and a public hearing. Uh, so the other um, aspects of Senate Bill 5290 is it introduces a compliance mechanism for local jurisdictions, uh, wherein a jurisdiction with a city of a population greater than 20,000 people is required to monitor and report to the state on uh, how they are complying with these timeframes. However, because Snoqualmie's population is lower than 20,000 people, Snoqualmie will not be, uh, for the time being, or the foreseeable future until that population threshold is reached, uh, required to monitor and report on its compliance with this. However, uh, there is a requirement uh, of Senate Bill 5290 that would also, if a city is fail fails to meet these timelines, uh, they could be required to implement, or I'm sorry, refund a portion of the permit application fees uh, to that individual applicant. So there, there is a uh, alternative to that uh, refund compliance mechanism. And if a city adopts three of 12, three of 12 suggested best management practices that the state has um, adopted, then the city does not have to comply with those permit refund requirements. So after discussing uh, with Director Arteche, uh, we believe that the best method moving forward for Snoqualmie would be to adopt three of those best management practices, most of which we're already uh, doing. So um, that's it's kind of just the formalization of that practice in the municipal code. So moving down to the strike through that is included in the packet, the majority of uh, the changes really occur in this table, 1430.020B, table one. On the right, you'll notice now this, this table um, breaks down each permit application uh, that the city accepts into a category based on how it's reviewed. So does it have a no public notice? Does it have a public hearing? Uh, and so the main changes here are going to be implemented in this table. You'll see on the right, we've added a project permit application processing time, and we've opted to comply with the requirements of 65, 100, and 170 days based on the uh, type of permit being applied for. The other aspect is uh, the state has um, refined the definition of a complete application so that there's a little bit less wiggle room. Previously, a jurisdiction could, there might have been more discretion as to when a, an application is complete. Moving forward, as long as an application meets the procedural requirements that are specified in the code, it will be considered procedurally complete. <clears throat> and then these changes are mostly for the sake of internal consistency, but if scrolling down to uh, subsection E, these are the three measures that uh, we have suggested to adopt of the uh, ones that are provided. Um, by the state. Those are projects that are consistent with the adopted development regulations will be expedited. The city already makes every effort to expedite every permit application. Um, and there's no formal require no formal guidelines as to how I should back up and say there's no formal uh, picture of how these best management practices are, are required to be implemented. So there is some discretion there. Um, the city of Snoqualmie already expedites to the extent possible every permit application. Two, maintain and budget for on-call on permitting assistance when permit volumes or staffing levels change. The city of Snoqualmie already budgets extensively for um, outside consultants when it requires technical expertise and assistance that it doesn't have in-house. So this is essentially already practice of the city 
The third is um, to meet with an applicant within 14 days of the second comment letter, uh, the second comment letter the city issues corrections on. And that's something that has always been available, but now it will be formalized in city code. Uh, and then this last change for clearing and grading is simply uh, removing duplicative text. Um, and those are the substantive changes that are being proposed for compliance by SB 5290. Once we adopt these changes, if they are adopted, uh, we would be, the muni Snoqualmie Municipal Code would be consistent with the requirements of uh, Senate Bill 5290. <clears throat> Go ahead. Chair, I, I have no um, concerns that are apparent um, can we put this on the regular agenda item then for adoption so that we will have the full council's ability to to review this and, and ask questions as appropriate? So I can make sure. That... Okay. Uh, I was going to lean. Oh, wait a minute. This is an ordinance, isn't it? Never mind. So we can't do consent, right? Right. Correct. Okay. Never mind. Correct. Then that's yeah. how we have to do it. <laughs> There is an ordinance in the agenda packet. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is yeah, just we're discussion for yeah. the... So we can't put this on the exactly. agenda. Yeah. So it's got to go for discussion. Was that your point? Yeah. 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 Council number one. Okay. okay. Just, um, just one moment here. I just wanted to... No worries. Actually, um, I do have a... Please go ahead, Joe. Yeah. Um, Council member Johnson. I mean, this is one of those things in the category, it seems like we don't have too many options here. It's kind of law. Um, but I was just curious, though, you did say <clears throat> that uh, one of the consequences was that if we didn't adopt it, that uh, the city, correct me if I'm misunderstanding here, but that the city would have to uh, pay back some amount of uh, permit fees or something along those lines. I'm just curious, is there any idea of how much that would add up to, hypothetically? The city of Snoqualmie, except for wireless facility communication permits, doesn't actually have any permit fee, any mm -hmm. fee schedule for its permit applications. So it's not clear exactly how those requirements would apply since um, the majority of the permit fees the city issues are directly related to um, time and materials that are billed to the applicant. So the state has not provided any indication of how that requirement could play out. However, by adopting the three best practices, we avoid that conversation. Yeah. And um, that's that's after consulting with the city attorney and doing research on the matter, that's kind of how the department thought would be best to address the issue. Just, Clean just it, do it, maybe. Just, yeah. just do it. <laughs> yeah. Especially since the majority of the the practices we're formalizing are already in are already the standard practice of community development department. So just a quick question, just procedural here. So is it, what brings this exactly in compliance with the Senate bill? Is it the summary, is it adding the summary of new permit forecasting timeframes or is it section C, D, and E? It's, uh, so it is section, it's, it's a little bit of all of it. It is C, D, and E because so the real the meat and potatoes here is really us formal the city formalizing in this table one that uh, we are going to abide by these permit processing timelines and um, the method by which we are going to do that is C D and E. Okay. Uh, we are going to implement these stand these practices as standards, and um, D here is. The, t the clock only runs when the ball's in the city's court, essentially. So from that 65 days, when the city gets a complete application, the clock starts. But when we return the application for comments or corrections, the clock stops. And then eventually, if the applicant is not responsive, as defined by D, then that would... Uh, that would... Uh, allow us to s suspend the clock and not um, have to comply with that time frame. 
thank you. Thank you for the clarity. Okay, if there aren't any further questions, I agree with Councilmember Watton that we should um, move this forward for a larger council discussion. So, okay. if there aren't any further questions, we'll move on to the next item. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, I'll scroll back up here. Okay, so I believe that brings us to our discussion items. Uh, first item of discussion is the mayor's proposed 2025-2026 biennium budget department presentations. And we'll hear from director. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Washington. And Good evening, Council. Uh, glad to be here today. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, currently Council has been through three uh, really budget workshops uh, with the staff at this point, probably totaling about seven or eight hours at, um, <laughs> to this point uh, when it comes Great. to that itself. Uh, in essence, we've answered probably about 30 plus questions or so um, at this stage as well. And so right now, what we're here to engage in is a department presentation and that department presentation it's only one department it's the department that's responsive to this committee and that is the community development department uh just to go over a little bit about your updated budget book i know councilmember johnson doesn't quite have one with him right now okay. so. joe if you want you can come down here and look, oh, sure. look at mine it's like that but we also have one here jana do you mind handing him uh, one of the budget books. Thank you. Uh, there is an insert inside that budget book, which will explain to you the changes from the previous uh, budget document to the current updated one that you have in front of you today. So feel free to kind of look through that um, as you kind of go through the document itself. I also just want to talk a little bit about the next steps moving forward. So our next budget roundtable will be on September the 23rd. We're hoping through that date uh, to be able to field some of the questions that you're Probably gonna, we're probably gonna receive from the committee presentations throughout this week. Hopefully, come back with some of those answers that uh, to the questions that you may have tonight and tomorrow. Uh, and then, ideally, hopefully by the end of that budget roundtable, uh, we'll have a sense of exactly maybe the direction the council may want to go, including some of the proposed changes you may have to the budget. Uh, primarily because we need at least about a week to kind of figure out what those changes and what the impacts are going to be on us financially. Uh, moving forward and so uh, in order for us to really kind of start hammering away at what that final budget looks like we're going to need those recommendations from council ideally on september the 23rd um september the 30th uh, the next date after that we would then hash out what those kind of changes look like um reveal that information to you as well and then we're targeting adoption on october the 3rd so just a couple more dates between now and then in which we hope to have the budget adopted and so with that said, uh, if you have any questions after the council presentations, feel free to email me or the director herself um, about any sort of questions you have about what she's planning to accomplish for the next two years or what's in the budget. Um, and I guess with that said, without further ado, I'd like to bring Emily up for her presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Chair. Oh, sorry. I, uh, I, I just city want to... City Administrator. I just want to make the request that you email both. Um, I know Emily has some days out of town here coming up, so I don't want to miss something. Okay. So CC you in on questions? Or Drew and Emily, either, whatever. Okay. So, yeah. so there's more than one person getting it, so we make sure it gets answered. All right. right, Will do. Thank you. Thank you, City Administrator. Well, hello, and um, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you about um, the department budget. I'd like to just go over the department overview and go over the core mission or core mission and core functions of the department. The community development department implements smart growth principles through sustainable city planning, proactive local and regional administration, and balanced economic development. You may not know it, but there are multiple functions that are going on in the community development department. Um, including community events and outreach, long range and current planning, civil and stormwater engineering, building permit review, inspections, code enforcement, and fire marshal, economic development and tourism, climate change, Meadowbrook farm preservation, floodplain and shoreline management, as well as growth management. 
There are six key positions in the department, including a building official, community liaison, permit technician. We also have a number of different contracted staff. I call them contracted staff. They're extended staff. Um, there's at least 10 of our supporting contractors out there from land use to transportation, environment, civil and storm water engineering, landscaping, floodplain management. Um, they're all essential to getting these core functions um, down and, and main, maintaining the department. You also see administrative specialist, which is shown on the organizational chart and um, a vacancy for senior or assistant planner. Next slide. So this department is the only department with the Easter Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of our accomplishments this year include a tourism website, um, Visit Snoqualmie. If you haven't had a chance to go to the website, check it out. Um, the adoption of the 2021 building code, you, if you remember that, we talked about um, the card room or the game room and all of the other interesting um, add-ons to that. The comprehensive plan, do you recall our six months <laughs> visits at <laughs> six o'clock? Um, we are nearly to the finish line um, with the adoption and an upcoming resolution this fall. Growth management housing studies, you, you recall the approvals and all the hard work that the council put into housing strategy plan, uh, middle housing, um, the housing element, uh, housing needs analysis, citywide, valleywide, they're all very important to supporting the comprehensive plan. Something that we do annually is the CRS recertification this year was an uh, especially hard one because we had a five-year recertification and an annual sort of recertification that went on kind of simultaneously. We also were very productive with Meadowbrook Farm legislation, the interlocal agreements, the memorandum, memorandum of understanding, the maintenance agreement. We also accomplished our first Residential targeted area, if you recall that, with new legislation and the appointment of uh, uh, the mill site as our first designated area. And here's a very exciting one, awarded and received over $4 million in grant monies. Um, and that came in um, through a variety of different sources, including the Department of Commerce, um, the Flood Control District, um, and a number of other different entities. And then I put community engagement down. Um, we've extended many opportunities through events and, and other scheduled um, calendar items that brought the community together, including a number of different open houses that we did for the comprehensive plan. Next slide. <clears throat> so here you can see at a glance, you know, the community development functional classification, you know, we're under line item 001 uh, with a biannual budget, um, salary, wages, employee benefits, supplies, services, um, capital, and transfers out. Those last two are empty. Our I think our biggest change here is just recon, um, recognizing that we are a city that uses consultants. And so there's a slight bump up with um, our services for 2025 and 2026. And, you know, you'll be seeing our, uh, on the next slide, you know, you know some of our projected work program, it, it also goes into some, some pretty heavy lifts that we'll be doing in the, in the next two years, which includes consolidating our development codes into one development code um, and possible expansion of the business park, which would lead into um, an annexation strategy study. Next slide. And I'm sorry, is that um, we're planning for that next year? That's right. Mm -hmm. And I just love this this picture. If you can you guess what it is? Fourth of July. Yeah, it's the 4th of July. Yeah. Is that the why? It looks like a, an amoeba or something. <laughs> um, so this was a an uh, aerial drone that, that was shooting uh, different photos throughout the event. And this one was kind of right when people were starting to pack in for the big event. 
uh, so our department work program for the next couple of years, I've already mentioned this just a second ago, it's the integration of the development code. You may not know it, but there's at least three development codes that are floating out there in addition to the municipal code. And we've got to bring those down to, to, to one. So we're not trying to administer multiple development codes over you know, long periods of time. Maintain our community rating system, which is which is really key, and even going the next step step farther, which would be lowering the, the the rating system. There's a huge benefit to insurance rates if we could just you know dip down to from a five to a four, mm -hmm. and see some huge cost savings there. Mm -hmm. Continued river trail acquisitions. You know we we also accomplished one of our um, uh, um, a closing on one of our properties that's in this master plan. It was one that, you know, had taken a long time between, you know, this last one and the one before, but we managed to do that. We're also starting a home elevation program, um, which is really key to our floodplain mitigation, uh, raising homes above the, the three feet above the base flood elevation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Continued tourism and business expansion, possibly in the, the, the potential annexation area. Um, an area was mapped out many years ago for future expansion of the business park with our, an existing future land use designation. Major permitting, if you, 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 you know about these things because you talk about them all the time. They include the Stokolmi Valley Hospital, the mill site, the community center, the train museums. Permitting systems, integrating into a, a completely digital um, permit tracking system with a public portal it will be key to the future of the success of the department and um, efficiencies in the city. Code enforcement. We've got a number of different code enforcement cases going on that you're aware of and more community engagement. And, you know, throughout the year, you'll see the continued um, support of the community as we engage with them in different activities throughout the year. And that's what I have on the department budget. I'm happy to answer any questions. Just a quick question. Just I know we started a conversation on the impact uh, fees, and I'm just thinking that maybe is that kind of nestled in the major permitting piece? Uh, are you just referring back to Senate Bill 5290? Right. Correct. Yeah. Uh, we do we do collect fees. Um, they are in the form of a deposit. Mm -hmm. So we um, project how much it's going to cost to actually process the permit and in any expenditures that we incurred, just getting to the point of application. Um, it's, it's different. Um, that's a different um, different animal. Uh, we, we may go to the next step further with you know, a fee resolution and, and ident identifying a flat fee for every type of permit. We, we haven't gotten to that point yet. Okay. Okay. Is that something that we want to, you know, kind of specifically speaking about impacting fees? Is that something that we want to take a look at next year? Yeah. And impact fees could also go into the update of the school impact fees. Um, you know, you, you will be seeing traffic impact fee and that traffic impact fee program coming forward at your okay. next um, CD meeting in October. Okay. So we're ready to take the next step with that. Okay. Um, and then there's application fees. Okay. Um, possible fee resolution for that. And then there's just major permitting itself and in, in the applications. Thank kind you. Of, kind of yeah, makes a lot, sense. A lot of fine nuances. Yeah. Makes sense. Did you have a question? Sure. Uh, oh, did you want to go? Shall I respond as well? Please. Okay. Um, <laughs> so Emily has been instrumental to getting the transportation impact fees to where they are right today. Part, but certainly next year we do want to explore other impact fees such as the fire impact fee as well as the parks impact fee which will also incorporate or require a lot of effort from the cd department um, you also heard from our contract planner as well you mentioned application fees mm -hmm. well, we've had conversations about the comprehensive fee study there are fees that we are not currently charging for example that we may want to consider as a part of that uh, comprehensive fee study i think overall so we're going to have to really kind of delve in into what our current fee structure kind of looks like overall. What do we have? What do we not have? A lot of that has not been checked or looked at in a very long time period. Since I've been here, we've never done a comprehensive fee study. Um, even before that, I haven't heard of one 
conducted at the city and like clockwork, we need to probably be looking through that about every 10 years or so every decade to make sure that we're in alignment with other benchmarks at other cities and that we're charging the right fees um, for what the market can hold. So with that said, I'll turn it back over for additional questions. Yeah, it's, but you will see the the traffic impact fee program coming forward and, and a refresh on the um, school impact fees. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Council Member Johnson. Yeah, so my I think my biggest question is going to center around uh, the staffing at uh, the community development uh, department. <clears throat> Do you want to go back to that slide or? Oh, sure. That might be a good idea. Idea. There. Um, so, past it. so we do have a number of positions, six FT total. And uh, I am not sure what the exact current vacancies are at what levels, but my understanding is that there are some and that uh, we have uh, the opportunity to use contracts to fill in some of those vacancies so that the city can function. <laughs> uh, what I'm uh, curious about on that is... Um, to some degree, the uh, administration's intent for the 5% vacancy, I would hope that that's not intended to land on the backs of community development alone. Uh, but uh, separately from that, although I do want to answer too, uh, but separately <laughs> from that is um, the, uh, right, uh, the difference in both cost and uh, the bang for our buck that we get from having uh, an in-house employee versus a contract contractor filling in that position mm -hmm. all right city administrator i'll start i may throw it to you because you start with administration <laughs> um so just so you're brought up to speed we have uh planning interviews happening this week um we've been recruiting for about a month um so we have some promise, promising candidates currently there is one planner vacancy open Okay. Um, in the CD department. Um, one thing that uh, the director has asked for is to reclassify a planner as an administrative support person. Um, mm. I, I am supporting that request. The request is now forward to council to see if you're going to support that request. But um, I, Emily and I had a long conversation about that, and she convinced me that was the best thing for her department. Um, so no, we're not eyeing the community <laughs> development department to hold the 5% vacancy down there um, and, and stop this important work. Yeah. Um, as for the thought process that goes into whether contracting it out or using in-house staff, first step is to get in-house staff and then identify you know what, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and you want to build on their strengths. So that doesn't mean you ignore their weaknesses. You develop those weaknesses so they become strengths too. Ideally, over time, more and more occurs in house and less and less occurs out of house because that is a better level of customer service for our customers. But when we first get somebody in, if they have a weakness, the tendency will be to contract that out because you want it done right the first time. It's less expensive that way. Thank you. Please add to it, Emily. Yeah, I would just add... Um that you see a lot of these contracted staff. Um, we have Andrew Levins here today that that functions and, and acts like staff. Um, you know, Andrew does attend our departmental staff meetings. Um, he has a, a significant amount of knowledge about the city of Snoqualmie and um, has taken on uh, projects um, just you know, single-handedly almost, but, you know, I do guide him and we work very closely together, but the, the kind of um, work products that we're getting, you know, from our consultant help are, you know, they're superior and at, you know, you know, there's a, there's a trade-off. We don't obviously pay for benefits for, you know, these contracted staff, they work, you know, specifically a la carte, so to speak. So um, I can give a task, I can give specific par parameters, I can I can price out the task um, and see that it's completed. So um, it's very effective, uh, especially with product work projects that are associated with development um, and that have reimbursable expenses. Um, but in this case, um, Andrew's actually taken on um, a mixture of different projects. You can just see he, he, he presented on SB 5290. Um, and, you know, he's going to be presenting to the Planning Commission tonight on 
uh, retail district overlays and a long um, standing council priority for <clears throat> addressing Center Boulevard. Council Member Johnson. So just a, a quick clarification, I want to make sure I got the order correct. Was the idea to move someone from being an administrative specialist to being an associate planner, or is the intent to go the other way? I got just a little bit lost. So this is, um, no, we don't have anybody to uh, convert from, from a planner um, <clears throat> profession to ad, administrative assistant. Um, the administrative assistant is functioning um, to help the department do AEP, AR, um, back billing, aged billing, deposits. Okay. Um, things like that. Go ahead. So currently, Emily's budgeted for two planning positions. Mm -hmm. um, and her request is to reclassify one of those planning um, positions as the administrative position. Okay. And that position okay. is currently vacant. Mm -hmm. And it will remain vacant pending the outcome of the budget process. Director, can you just go back to the budget slide just so we can kind of have that up? I just have a quick question. Sure. Okay, perfect. So just a touchy subject here. Um, kind of looking at, just looking at the budget and looking at the $4 million that came in from the grants, I'm just, the question for me would be, well, if we had a full-time grant writer, could we maybe see that mark maybe at 16 million? Would it Would it be worth it? No, I, I wouldn't have enough work for a full-time grant writer, um, but I squeeze in those grant applications single-handedly, okay. <laughs> and I think I got another one, too, that I, I don't want to so burst my bubble for it's another million. it's incorporated into your role as well? Um, I have taken it on. Um, you know, I mean, if the grant becomes too unwieldy, you know, it'll become more of a of all hands on deck. I mean, the city did apply for some FMA um, and HMA grant writing at um, at FEMA. It became way too complicated. We had to learn a new technology, FEMA Go. Um, everybody started working on it. Um, in the end, we chose to get grant money in a different way to, to continue on with the same programmatic mission of the department, um, you know, flood mitigation. So yeah, the other ones I've been able to do and i um, been able to do them successfully uh but yeah if there was 16 million out there right now and we needed to go get it maybe we would hire somebody temporarily to you know just to figure out how to fill out the forms and get them in but i don't i don't have that that large of, of a dollar amount ready to grab that i know of so currently it just it couldn't cost justify itself i don't think i'd have enough work for um, a full time, but I but I would make the pitch to bring someone in um, as a temporary mm. uh, on a temporary basis if I knew that there was a big a big grant out there to go get, um, and I didn't have anybody to do it. Okay, thank you. Thank and you. these other positions, they they are very key. But you know, when we talk about civil civil engineering, stormwater engineering, landscaping, um, environmental, um, transportation planner, I mean, all super and duper important but I, I wouldn't have 40 hours a week for any one of them. Um, and each one of them is like a specialty within their own. So even to hire that level of, of special professionalism and the department is just highly irregular in any, any city of this size. So to have access to them at our beck and call, it's, it's amazing. Okay. okay. Do you have a question? No, I'm kidding. Do you have a follow-up? Sorry, sorry. So food for thought for, I think, everyone. It's not just the CD department that is generating grants, but it's also other departments within the city that also have grant opportunities as well. In addition to that, in some cases, what other cities may do, you don't necessarily see a city of this size doing something like this, but there are positions out there called intergovernmental relations coordinators mm -hmm. for the most part. So they may handle not only just the grant writing, but also you know, the collective need and the relationships that we might have with that really, I mean, frankly, right now that the mayor and both council are trying to accomplish, right, with our state elected officials, mm -hmm. could potentially serve in that role as an additional support uh, for the mayor and council. So you can kind of tie some of these things together a little bit. And really, I just wanted to share that as food for thought. So thank you. Thank you, Director. Yes. I just wanted to add that some of those grant funds are only awarded and haven't yet been received. They've been folded into the 2025-26 budget as well. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Mm 
Councilmember Johnson. So then just to clarify, then the change in the salaries and wages and employee benefits uh, from 23, 24 to 25, 26. So that was what was budgeted for 23, 24, but those are not actuals, right? So are the actuals more similar to 25, 26? Yeah, so those are not actuals. Those are what we budgeted for 23, 24. If you recall last year, council approved a, um, I would say a staffing plan, um, overall a staffing plan agenda bill that reduced the number of FTEs within the CD department, but did not make any changes to the overall appropriation for the department. Some of those funds were um, committed to other objectives within the department, um, really in specific of support of the comprehensive plan and so on. So, yes. So actually, uh, follow up then? Absolutely. So then is this increase in services, looking at that bullet point down there, uh, is that kind of like filling in that that gap of that extra work that is not being done by employees, but is being done by contracts, and that counts as a service? Partially, yes, it does count as a service, but then also you have to keep in mind that there are uh, large increases in the internal service charges as well. So um, probably not R and R, but IT facilities maintenance. Uh, there are some of those facility or those internal service charges that are also impacting that service okay. line that you see there. Yeah. <clears throat> City Administrator Chamless. Sorry. And isn't the climate change work change work in there also? Yeah. And that would be a pretty big number impacting the services line, right? Yeah, the, the climate change is five hundred thousand. Mm. That's contracted, right? Yeah. Correct. And that's under the, the service piece, correct. Okay. Yeah, what, Janet, do you so that's want to the deny? So that's the lion's share of it, <laughs> right? By looking at this, let, I would. I'll let Jenna. Oh, sorry. So we included $150,000 in extra expenses that are on that one timeline item for the 10 year forecast. Mm -hmm. And those are associated with the climate change grant. So 500,000 coming in, 150,000 going out with the rest being done okay. by staff. Okay, makes sense. Follow up question, Council. Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. No more questions from my side. I'm I'm good. So okay, so if there aren't any other questions, then we'll move to the next discussion item, which is the draft request for qualifications, the RFQ review. <clears throat> and have you kick us off with that, please, Director Arteche? Well, let me share my screen. So you have in your packet um, a brief memo, um, which is uh, which references the actual RF draft RFQ. Let me bring that up um, because it, it'll be a little bit more informative. Okay. I have too many windows open and I can't see which window it's on it's at. Okay, there we go. Sorry about the wait. So you asked for it and, and you got it. Um, attached 
um, on, on your screen, you'll see the request for qualifications for workforce housing. This is a draft. Um, it does have some blanks to fill in, um, but it gives you an idea of what, you know, what, what would it look like if we sent something out to those perhaps 50, um, 50 firms that might be, you know, lined up to do this kind of work. Um, we can just kind of go through them in the introduction. There's a little bit of information about, you know, the city and why the city would want to be doing a project like this. Goes into the scope of work. A little statement about qualifications. How to submit. Go ahead. Director, I just have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So second paragraph there second sentence so affordable housing is considered to be up to 60 percent ami next sentence etc between 80 and 120 percent of ami correct me if i'm wrong we can establish a floor but we can't establish a ceiling on the ami correct that's my understanding of it um, I, I, I'm not sure how to answer that question, so I'd, I'd need to get back to you. Um, these, these, yeah. these benchmarks are, are coming from the Department of Commerce and from King County. Um, so they're setting the windows for, you know, what percentages to put into these various groupings. Um, and, you know, 80% is a, is a defined, you know, endpoint, 120 is another defined endpoint, but. I don't know if they're actual ceilings. Yeah. We could maybe find an answer on that. I've just, I've been having some discussions with affordable housing officials and, you know, kind of just going back and forth. And my understanding is we can't, we can, we can define a floor, but we can't essentially cap it. Mm -hmm. so I just, I'd be curious if that is in fact the case. Mm-hmm. Because I think you can deed restrict units, and so it would be based on income. So I would think that you could cap it. it it's in our For interest to try and define some groupings because we'll be able to, you know, we'll be able to demonstrate that we've met, you know, some of our our housing expectations. Do you have a comment, Council? Yeah, I'm I'm still grappling with this because. For the last two years, we've been through our housing task force mm -hmm. talking about the implementation and and the, the the feedback I've gotten from both developers and from from other task force members is is the idea of going straight to the RFP. We know that there's only a certain number of players, and I think that the other thing that has kind of um, unfolded or, or been um, revealed is city of North Bend was the first to do this. Um, but it's a concept we've, we've all have discussed. And, and um, my, my first take was maybe there'd only be two or three organizations interested in even pursuing this, but in the RFP that the North Bend did, they got 14 developers that that met with them on an informal basis before before submitting they had i think up to 5 submissions um on a piece of property that albeit it's flat and and this one's a little more unique but yeah. um my concern is this if we go through the RFQ and we've got this information that we can use in fact our, our attorney, David Linehan, said that, you know, you can roll both of them into an RFP. But my concern is this. It's going to take us six months just to go through an RFQ. And really, it's with building and construction and all the constraints there, we're really talking about extending out this, this process another year, really. Um, I'd rather to take this information, fold it in an RFP, and just move forward faster. My my understanding from our our last discussion on it, it would be on the the RFQ that we kind of settled on the RFQ because it would be an arduous task right now for the staff that potentially could take six I don't know many more months for an RFP. Well, uh, 
and and just keep in mind it is not the staff of north bend reviewing the rfps it's a committee so just well no it's for a us committee, to put it together it's a committee of five well there's there's rfps already out there that we can we can draw from and and those are on m RSC and we can roll in the the qualifications as part of a preamble, if you will, to it. So I'm I just want to make sure that you know we we approach this and and expedite it as quickly mm -hmm. as possible without you know um, delaying. I mean we've we've we need to come up with a solution sooner than later. That's my answer. Councilmember Johnson. I uh, absolutely hear uh, that quite loud and clear. Uh, I just thought that uh, that my understanding was from staff that it would take significantly more effort and time to get to the RFP. Um, if um, if that's not the case, then that would be great. Uh, I guess uh, North Bend has one, so is that something we could take that as a template and swap out some words and? Ta-da, now we have our RFP, or is it substantially more work than that? And to what degree? City Administrator. It boils down to what's, what's your level of risk that you're willing to tolerate and, mm. and what your direction is to staff. Obviously, we can get an RFP done if that's what direction is. Um, with an RFP, you need to make sure every I is dotted and every T is crossed. Um, otherwise, you wind up with a, a, a apartment complex that doesn't have enough parking, and then you have parking issues, or you wind up with um, dead end streets that are diff more difficult for law enforcement to. I mean, all these things can be overlooked in that process. Um, so, I mean, we can certainly. Take North Bend's RFP, change a couple of words, and voila, there you got RFP. But um, it depends on what you would like us to do. Councilmember Johnson. So then the difference has been like a month, so I'm trying to remember exactly where we were last time. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the key differences was that with the RFQ, they come in with the proposal and there is more room to discuss uh, the, the finer points uh, with them, whereas in the RFP, it is closer to the final product. Am I understanding that correctly? With an RFP, you are defining the product you want and, and searching for somebody to create it. Right. With an RFQ, you're looking for a partner well, to help you design the product you want. Council member one. One other point, too, is when the city of North Bend looked at it, they said we could put maybe 14 units on and some of the proposals that came back with had as many as 30 units and ample parking in the same. So it allows for a certain amount of innovation that sometimes government is not really the best place for that to happen. <clears throat> my concern is that you know i've seen the property that's being proposed in north bend it's substantially different than the, than the property we're proposing here um question for you director to put together an rfp how long potentially would it take of this magnitude i don't have an estimate right now longer than six months potentially mike yeah you in a, I, I would say somewhere between 60 and 90 days. And we may have to contract it out. We we would have to contract it out. I'll just be honest with her. See if we have somebody. Not being our... dishonest. We may have to contract it out. <laughs> and Councilmember Jonathan. Yeah. 
two um, minutes left before council yeah, well, planning commission has to start. I'm going to take one more comment from council member Johnson and we'll have to table this for the next uh, community development meeting. Council member Johnson. So then would that contract uh, operate within the administration's current appropriation or uh, would that have to be something to come to council? Yeah, no. You have to come to council. It's within the appropriation. It's within the appropriation. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it is. All right. Right. Well, we continue. Yeah. <laughs> With that said, we have two minutes until the planning commission. So we'll, um, if this is okay with everyone, we'll go ahead and table this discussion for the next community development meeting. Um, so that brings everything to a close. If there are no further business to come before the commission or before the committee, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Second. 